Hey guys, welcome to Elevated Systems. I'm your host CJ and over the past year and a half for anyone looking for a moderately affordable tiny desktop PC that can handle any and all basic and even more demanding computing tasks, something they can just plug in, not worry about it, and it accomplish the work they want to accomplish, I've recommended this, the base model M1 Mac Mini. In fact, my wife, like me, has been a lifelong PC user, and over a year ago, I swapped out her Windows system for this Mac Mini, and she's transitioned with no issues, and as a side effect, she hasn't had to call IT support, aka me, to fix a computer problem for her since. But what about people who want all that, but don't want to or can't leave the Windows ecosystem? Well, just like the older Intel Mac minis, mini PCs in the past have been either overpriced, underperformant, or both. However, in line with desktop CPUs, lower powered mobile CPUs have gotten a lot more powerful and energy efficient, and a lot more manufacturers are building mini PCs around these powerful multi-core mobile processors. Manufacturers like Knopflink, who sent over their N600 mini PC, which is powered by AMD's 5900HX, the most powerful Ryzen mobile processor currently available in a mini PC. Let's check it out. All right, guys, quick agenda. We're gonna unbox this PC, see what it comes with, go over all the features and specs, demo some setup options, boot it up, see what comes installed on the system, and then we'll test out the system's performance and some basic and more advanced productivity and creativity workflows, and even check out some gaming performance. And I'll be comparing all of that to the M1 Mac Mini to see how it stacks up. Let's start by unboxing this mini PC, and we start to see just how mini this mini PC is, as half the volume of the box is foam and accessories. So there is the Knopflink N600, a very compact 120 watt power supply, a VESA mounting bracket and hardware, and a SATA connection cable. The mini PC is quite mini, measuring 146 millimeters in length and width, and 43 millimeters high, giving a total footprint of about 213 square centimeters and a total volume of just 0.9 liters. Compared to the Mac Mini, the Knopflink is about seven millimeters taller, but has a 45% smaller footprint and about 35% less total volume. Starting in the front of the system, there are three 10 gigabit USB ports, one type C and two type A, as well as the main power switch. On the back, we have the DC power input, four five gigabyte type A ports, HDMI 2.0 and DisplayPort 1.4 outputs, and both one gigabit and 2.5 gigabit LAN ports. Finally, there's a 3.5 millimeter combo headphone mic jack. On the back of the system, we also find two screws that by removing, allows us to remove the top cover and access the pre-installed 512 gigabyte Gen 3 M.2 NVMe SSD, 32 gigabytes of DDR4 2666 soda memory, and the Intel Wi-Fi 6 Bluetooth 5.2 module. There's also a SATA connection that allows us to install a standard 2.5 inch SSD, which mounts to the underside of the cover plate. Flipping the unit over, it's less obvious how to remove the panel, but removing the rubber feet reveals four screws. After removing the panel, we can see the cooling fan and copper heat sink, as well as a second M.2 slot that's compatible with both NVMe and SATA SSDs, so I'll test the Western Digital SATA M.2 SSD in this one. Under the heat sink, we'd find the Ryzen 9 5900HX. This is an eight core 16 thread processor built on the Zen 3 seven nanometer architecture with a base clock of 3.3 gigahertz and a max boost clock of 4.6 gigahertz. The 5900HX has 16 megabytes of L3 cache and an integrated Radeon Vega eight core GPU with a frequency of 2100 megahertz. The Mac Mini is the 8-core M1 model with the 8-core GPU. It's not user serviceable or upgradable, so it has 256 gigs of storage and 8 gigs of unified memory, and that's all it can ever have. But it does have two Thunderbolt 3 ports for high-speed peripheral expandability, and there is a model available with 10 gigabit LAN. As far as accessories, I want to point out the power supply as this is a GAN or gallium nitride power supply and while GAN chargers are becoming more prevalent as they're much more compact and run much cooler than silicon chargers, this is the first 120 watt GAN power supply I've worked with and 
it is impressive that what used to be a giant brick is now able to be a wall wart style charger that's more than half the size. Now, personally, I think this is still a bit large to be a wall wart and may have been more flexible as an inline brick like the 60 watt GAN charger for my laptop, but it does work and is even light enough to plug in upside down into the under desk mounted power strip I use. As far as setup, you can mount the mini PC to a 75 or 100 millimeter vase mount using the included bracket, but I just set it desktop, connecting it via the display port to my Scepter 1440p monitor, and I mirrored the display via the HDMI to my capture card. For peripherals, I have the KG722 mechanical keyboard and the MG510 wireless mouse from Deepcool. On the initial power up, the Knopflink booted straight into a pre-configured Windows administrator account. This may seem convenient, but there are better and more secure ways for system integrators to do Windows OEM installs that still include all the required hardware drivers and software, but allow users to go through the Windows setup process and configure their own user account. On the positive side, it is the pro version of Windows and a quick look through the menu doesn't reveal any extra bloatware. So after a quick Windows and Radeon driver update, I was working on a fairly light operating system. Now, before I even got into any of the testing of the Knopflink PC, I noticed how loud this thing was. So the first test I ran was an ADA64 system stability test to see if the system was thermally stable. And what I noticed was that while the 5900HX has a configurable TDP of 35 to 54 watts, Knopflink has dialed it up to its max TDP. And surprisingly, we can even take it up farther with just general Windows power management. We can also dial it down if we wanted to, and honestly, in most basic day-to-day -day computing tasks, you won't notice any difference. In fact, right off the top, I'm just gonna concede that for other than top-tier productivity power users, the typical PC user isn't gonna notice any difference in basic computing between this, the Mac Mini, or most other comparable modern computers. I did run the PC Mark 10 test suite on the Knopflink, and while that test suite isn't compatible with the Mac, the results are much better than my Intel i7-1165 laptop, but while apps may launch a few nanoseconds quicker, Excel calculations may be milliseconds faster, websites may load faster, again, by nanoseconds, I'd be hard pressed to notice any difference in day-to-day -day tasks. In fact, I'd contend that if all you do is basic tasks like home office work, either on an office suite like MS Office on your computer or through a web portal, video conferencing, web browsing, streaming media consumption, then you don't need to spend $800 to $1,000 on either of these two mini computers as you can get a very capable system for those types of tasks for three, four, five hundred dollars max. So I'm going to focus more on the demanding tasks that someone spending this kind of money is more likely looking at. And I'm going to start with Geekbench 5 because those results will give us a good idea of where this mini PC lands in terms of full desktop processors. And with a multi-core score of 8157, puts it right with a Ryzen 5 5600X. It actually beats out an Intel 12400 and 11600K. That's pretty impressive considering I'll be building an i5-12400 system next week and just the cooler I'll be using is almost the same volume as this entire computer. The multi-core score is also about 5% better than the Apple Silicon, while the Mac Mini has a 17% better single core performance. And with the assistance of its onboard media engine, the M1 scores 31% higher in graphics performance. Cinebench R23 shows the Knopflink significantly outperforming the Mac by 55% in multi-core performance, while the M1 takes just a 2% lead in single-core performance. This strong multi-core CPU performance does translate into some practical gains for the Ryzen PC over the Mac. 
For example, the Blender benchmark shows on average 90% faster rendering for the Knopf link. However, this is an example of where benchmarks don't tell the entire story. See, while Blender can't take advantage of the onboard AMD Vega graphics on the 5900HX, the M1 can leverage its GPU for hardware accelerated rendering, which enables it to complete the classroom render 54% faster than the Ryzen PC. Now, 3D rendering may not be something users are looking to a mini PC for, so let's take a look at video editing performance. For this test, I'm using the Puget Bench plugin for Adobe Premiere Pro that honestly tests overall editing performance better than any real world scenario I can come up with. And here we do see the Mac performing significantly better, scoring a 593 to the Knopf Link's 199. This Again, mostly comes down to the M1's excellent onboard video encoders and decoders compared to the weaker AMD VCE encoders built into the 5900HX. But that doesn't mean the Mac is better at all video work. If I look at a practical application, something I do all the time, transcoding my raw camera footage for storage, the Ryzen Mini PC smoked the Mac. Using Handbrake to transcode a 4.2 gig X264 video file from my Panasonic Lumix to a 223 megabyte X265 file with no noticeable loss of fidelity only took nine minutes for the Knopf link, while the Mac took 22 minutes. And to transcode a 12.3 gigabyte 6K Blackmagic RAW file to a 370 megabyte X265 MP4, just shy of 37 minutes for the Mac, but just eight minutes, 20 seconds for the Ryzen PC. Now, this is due to the constant bitrate encoding I use that is strictly software encoding or all CPU horsepower. The Ryzen's multi-core performance shines here. However, like with Blender, if I use a virial bit encoding and take advantage of the hardware encoding, which is possible on the Mac, but not the PC, I can reduce the time for the Mac down to just two minutes, 51 seconds. However, the loss of quality at the same file size doing this is significant and not worth the save time. One of the last programs I tested with Photoshop, again, using the Puget Bench test. And again, this tiny system scored even higher than a full size eight core 16 thread Ryzen 7 5700G with the same integrated Vega eight core graphics. This Photoshop test is also not compatible with M1 Mac, but for the average Photoshop user outside of a few specific filters, you won't see much difference in performance. However, for photographers, there's definitely better performance for more intense work on the Mac. In this demo, I did a quick batch edit to just 98 camera raw files. And in a side-by-side -side comparison, you see the Mac applied the edits almost instantaneously while the PC lagged a bit. The difference doesn't seem that extreme, but multiply that by the thousands of photos even an amateur photographer may want to quickly batch edit and it'll get significant. Now, the last thing we're gonna look at is gaming performance. And here it gets a little more murky as the two systems are not entirely directly comparable. In titles that are directly comparable like Shadow of the Tomb Raider, the systems are basically neck and neck with the Mac just inching out the lead, but neither of them is what I'd call a AAA gaming machine. They're both what I'd call the casual office worker gamer systems. You wanna kill some time between conference calls with a round of Candy Crush, Among Us, Minecraft, Roblox. These will both do that easily, as well as some more demanding titles. With the Mac, you have the full Apple Arcade catalog to choose from, and on the PC, there is the Microsoft Store. You can definitely find something there that'll help you get through the workday. Both systems also have access to Steam games. However, this is where the Mac comes up a little short as the compatible selection of games is much smaller for the Mac, especially the M1. And even for those that are compatible, there are sometimes problems as here, I just couldn't get Dota Underlords to launch on my Mac mini. Now, I've already done a full video about gaming on the M1 Mac, so if you want more detailed info on that, you can check out that video. So now I'm gonna focus on some gaming titles that are playable on the Knopf link. Starting with some eSport titles, first is CSGO, which at 1080p low preset, played very smoothly, averaging over 100 FPS. Another popular title, Fortnite, 1080p on performance mode, again, averaged right around 100 FPS, and was also very responsive. Rocket League at 1080p performance preset offered stutter-free gameplay at just over 70 FPS average, although I was playing in training mode because I didn't have a controller handy and I have no idea how to play Rocket League on a keyboard and mouse. 
Moving into the racing genre, F1 2020 at 1080p low managed to break the 60 FPS threshold. And finally, I gave Doom Eternal a shot, but even at 1080p low settings, it struggled to maintain frame rates above 35 FPS, but despite that, I did end up playing for over 15 minutes without issue. Of course, full disclosure, I was playing at the I'm Too Young to Die's difficulty. So, final thoughts on the Knopflink N600 5900HX Mini PC. Well, just like the Mac Mini, it is insanely powerful for its size and power use. It's fully capable of accomplishing your everyday home office or entertainment computing tasks, as well as more demanding tasks like photo and video editing, graphic design, media transcoding, code compilation and debugging, 2D and 3D CAD, engineering analysis, data analytics, as a Windows PC, it'll run pretty much any industry standard application or software package. The serviceability and expandability is definitely a plus, especially for this form factor. There are a couple of cons. The first is, of course, with great power comes great noise. This thing is loud all the time. Even at idle, it's noticeable, especially when out of nowhere a background task might start up and the fan will just ramp up. It sounds like my wife's hair dryer sitting on the desk with me. This is definitely notable considering I've never heard the fan on the Mac Mini. It is dead silent. The other con is the weak Vega graphics. This iGPU is almost five years old now without much in the way of revision along the way. And knowing that the Ryzen 6000 mobile processors do have the RDNA graphics on board makes this 5900HX a tougher sell, especially seeing the performance gain with the newer CPUs. So if your workflow leans more graphics intensive, 3D rendering, or of course gaming, then you may want to wait until mini PCs are launched with the newer Ryzen 6000 processors. Now, ultimately, I was very impressed with this little powerhouse of a machine, and although I can't have something this loud in my studio where I film and edit videos, it does come with Windows Pro and 2.5 gigabit LAN, so I can move this anywhere in my house, like a basement closet, connect it to my 2.5 gig home network, and remote in from another system in my house, like my Mac Studio. I was really impressed with the Adobe Media encoding performance, so I think I'm gonna unload that task from a VM I have running on my Unraid server to this. That's my plan. What could you use a powerful little PC like this for, and could it replace your full-size desktop, or would you go with the Mac Mini? Let me know in the comments, and always, I hope to see you in the next one.